where we're continuing this evening in our study of the Holy War. It's written by John Bunyan, you recall, an allegorical look, really at the Christian life, uh, something similar to his other book, The Pilgrim's Progress, but this one is in the cast of a city, a city named Man's Soul, it stands for the soul of a man, and it's taken over by a, a tyrant, a, a wicked one named Diabolus. Uh, the city is rightfully owned by King Shaddai, represents God the Father, and Emmanuel his son, who understandably represents the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's, it's about the fall of man and King Shaddai and his son uh, retaking the town uh, for their glory and for the good of man's soul. And continuing on in the narrative of the Holy War this evening, you remember uh, last week we looked exclusively upon what we would call, in theological terms, the covenant of redemption. Uh, this eternal covenant between the members of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, primarily seen in Scripture between the Father and the Son, a covenant to effectually redeem uh, a people unto themselves for their glory. Uh, we read in Scripture in John 3.35 that the Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. The Father, out of His eternal love and devotion to His Son, gives all things to Him. And within that, He has given Him a people whom he will most surely see to it are saved to the uttermost. Remember the Lord Jesus in his earthly ministry said in John 6, 37, that all that the Father gives to me will come to me. The Father's given him a people and all of those whom he, he has given to him will come. And he says, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And he will never do so because he will not, he, he will not reject a love gift from his Father. But he will see to it that his Father's will is done which is why to purchase them, he does, as Emmanuel the Son said in the narrative, he'll do whatever it takes to have those people. He willingly lays his life down for those given to him. Jesus, the good shepherd, says in John 10, 18, that he lays his life down of his own accord. No one takes it from him, but he lays it down. He lays it down and he takes it back up again. And that charge or that command he had received from his father. And we mentioned that from these scriptural truths are... Uh, confession, the, the Second London Baptist Confession, our, our church's confession, puts it this way. This is chapter 8 on Christ the Mediator, the first paragraph. It says, God was pleased in his eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, his only begotten Son, according to the covenant made between them, to be the mediator between God and humanity. God chose him to be prophet, priest, and king, and to be head and savior of the church, the heir of all things and judge of the world. From all eternity, God gave to the Son a people to be his offspring. And in time, these people would be redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified by him. By him and his power to do so. Then along with that, we mentioned as well in this covenant that the Holy Spirit's role is to regenerate or to cause to be born again all those whom the Lord Jesus will effectually save in accordance with the Father's plan. And he will do so through the proclamation of the word of God that he moved men to write that this good news would be known by God's elect. We saw all this described for us from Bunyan in the narrative of the Holy War as news made its way to the good king Shaddai about Mansoul's rebellion with Diabolus and following Diabolus and allowing him to be king over Mansoul. And as it did, we saw how the king and his son, they went into their chambers to discuss the plan that they had already ordained beforehand that this would happen. They certainly did grieve what happened to Mansoul because of their love for what was theirs and their hatred of sin, but they had already planned that this would be permitted to happen, that the city would be recovered again in such a way that they would receive eternal glory. The son had firmly promised his father that he would be his father's servant to recover his man soul. He would journey into the country of universe and he would make a full payment according to justice and fairness and the follies of man soul and lay a foundation for its complete deliverance. And after that, we saw that an order was then given to the Lord Chief Secretary, the Lord Chief Secretary who represents the Holy Spirit in the Holy War, to prepare a copy of this plan and publish it all over the kingdom of universe. And as it was, Bunyan tells us that this message was published abroad and greatly disparaged by Diabolus. 
For he had then realized that he would be attacked and that man's soul would be taken away from him. All those in the king's court, however, were thrilled. They began to whisper among themselves and then to speak joyfully about the love of the king and his son for the miserable town. And flowing out from that, just in the flow of the text and the context, moving forward in the book this evening, what we see is Diabolus' response to this promise and message of grace from King Shaddai and, and his son. As we read, Diabolus was greatly disparaged by this promise of grace, and in this next section we see how he acts in light of that, or how he responds in light of that. Some of these coincide with other truths that we saw from the effects of the fall of mankind and Diabolus' remodeling of Mansoul, but we definitely see in this how Satan seeks to deceive the world today against the truth of the word of God, and within that really how the rebellious world allows itself to be deceived as well. Because let's remember, as fallen members of mankind, as fallen man-souls, we naturally hate God. We naturally have no fear of God before our eyes. We do not seek for him. We want nothing to do with him. And so Satan doesn't cause anybody to do, th do anything. It's not Satan's fault. We simply allow ourselves to be lured and enticed by our own desires, and it's that which he draws us in. That's what he deceives us in. At the end of the day, it, it is our fault that we sin. It's not the devil's fault. But firstly in this, we see that Diabolus seeks to keep the truth of God's word from Mansoul. In, in his response to the promise of grace of King Shaddai to retake the, the city by his son Emmanuel, Diabolus seeks to keep the truth of God's word from the city. Bunyan writes, and I quote, At last, as I said, the news reached the ears of Diabolus, and he concluded that these good tidings should be kept from Mansoul. He was convinced that if the people of the town should learn that Shaddai and his son were planning good for them, that they would revolt against him and his government and return to Shaddai. To accomplish his scheme, Diabolus again flattered Will Be Will. Will Be Will represents the will of man. He flattered Will Be Will and gave him strict command to watch all the gates day and night. The gates are the senses of man. He especially charged him to guard ear gate and eye gate. So don't let anything in the ears of Mansoul or anything in the eyes. And then Bunyan expresses to us that Diabolus gave Will Be Will orders to keep strong guards daily at every gate and not to let anyone into the town unless they are friends of their government. He also commanded Will Be Will to dispatch spies into the town to expose anyone plotting against them, to which Will Be Will, the will of man, willingly obeyed and kept the orders. So what we see here is that even though the word of God, even though the truth may be around, Diabolus has flattered the will of Mansoul to not receive it as truth, but to work within itself to totally keep the truth out. Even if it comes around, even if even it may acknowledge what it is, it will not receive it as such. It will not keep it within. And as I mentioned before, this goes right along with truths we've already expressed. Uh, that the God of this world, that Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And also Paul, the apostle, tells us in 2 Timothy 2.26 that we are naturally under the snare of the devil. We're naturally, as unbelievers, under the trap of the devil, being captured by him to do his will. And in that, the devil seeks to keep us away from a proper knowledge of the truth. If we're under the snare of the devil, then we don't have a proper knowledge of the truth. And beloved, just seeing this in the contemporary world we live in, this is why so many in this country, even in this area where there's a church on every corner, they can have a lot of Bible knowledge. They can know a lot of uh, scriptural facts, but they don't actually receive it as truth in their lives to follow it accordingly. They still live their life and how they feel it should be lived, and they think about topics in God's world purely in a manner that feels right to them. Many people today claim to be followers of Christ, they claim to be Christian, yet they're okay with murdering babies. They're okay with calling that just abortion and health care. Or they, they say they're okay with uh, homosexual marriage or transgenderism. Or even something that would, I guess will hit closer to the church. They're okay with women being pastors. And the scripture is very clear on that as well. People can claim to know the Bible, but they don't receive it as truth because you can see that in their, in their thinking. You can see that in how they conduct their lives. But church, we've been commanded to be doers of the word, 
doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving ourselves as our brother James declares in James 2.26. Because in just knowing some truth but not consistently seeking to think and live that truth out, that shows that you are still actually the authority in your life. You're still seeking to be God in your life. You're, st you're still seeking to be the authority and not the God who has revealed truth to you. And you're in a state of deception. If you like to cherry pick and take this and that out of, out of the Bible you, and, and not the whole thing, then you're really just the authority in your own life. You're just picking what you like and you're making yourself God. You know, so what if you say that you know God's word is true if you, so, if you show consistently in your thinking and living that you don't actually believe that? That you don't actually believe that because you consistently think and live in a way that just seems right to you and not what God's word says. If you're really just living life how you want to, you're then just showing in your life that your profession actually means nothing. And along with our natural disposition as fallen humanity to not seek the truth in, in such a condition, one is showing, uh, along with what Bunyan shows in this section, that they are still in the devil's snare. They're still under the snare of the devil. He still has them blinded as they have willingly allowed him to lure and flatter them into this position. And just as will be will, they will do whatever they have to in their thinking to put the truth away and to not actually follow it. They'll do whatever they have to continue to suppress it as we do to the truth that we know. Not follow it so that they can follow and think what they think is right. Beloved, it's why our will must be changed. Our, our Lord will be will must be changed by the sovereign grace of God or we will always war against his truth. We'll always seek to keep it out. We'll keep guards at, at ear gate uh, and at eye gate. We'll put spies into the city. I don't want anything to do with it because I want to do what I want to do. I want to follow what I want to follow. It's why all of ours, are, if we're converted in Christ Jesus this evening, it's why all of our wills had to be changed. We had to be given a new heart by the grace of God to delight in God's law, to delight in Him, and to seek to put away that is contrary to Him. Right along with this is not only the, the will of man bent towards sin, but the whole man is naturally corrupted. We see that Diabolus also imposed an oath upon the whole city, not just will be will, but the whole city, the whole man, that they would ever serve him. Bunyan writes, and I quote, Diabolus imposed a horrible oath upon the people by requiring that they swear never to desert him or his government, never to betray him or his laws, and to resist anyone who would deny him as their rightful king. He says the silly man soul did not hesitate to accept this monstrous agreement. They acted as if it were one tiny fish in the mouth of a whale, and they swallowed it without chewing. Were they troubled about it? No. They boasted about their loyalty to this pretend king, swearing their allegiance to him, and Diabolus had tied up man's soul securely. So this is one of the responses of Diabolus to Shaddai's promise of grace in his word. Diabolus seeks to keep man's soul from the truth. The devil seeks to keep mankind from the truth in the sense that they accept it or receive it for what it is. And in following him and thus just following their own opinions, man's soul thus wars against the truth. Secondly, right along with this, we continue to see in the narrative that Diabolus gives them liberty to do all of their heart's desires. He gives them freedom to do all of their heart's desires. Bunyan tells us, and I quote, Diabolus used one further exploit to secure himself. He commissioned a man named Mr. Filth to write an offensive, impure piece of beastliness and post it on the castle gate. Remember, the castle is the heart of man. We read that this nasty proclamation granted permission to all the people to do whatever they wanted to do without any hindrance or control. And the goal of Diabolus was to make the town so weak that if they heard that their redemption was planned, they would be unable to believe or hope to accept that truth. For reason says, the bigger the sinner, the less possibility of mercy, Diabolus said. And then Bunyan tells us that Diabolus posited that perhaps if he could get Mansoul to such a horrible condition of sin, if he could get them to be such horrible sinners that even Shaddai and Emmanuel would not even want to redeem them any longer because of their holiness, because they were so holy, they wouldn't even want to redeem them because they would be so sinful, which is, we would understand with biblically saturated minds, is simply ridiculous because regardless of how heinous or uh, big our acts of sin have been in our life, 
sin across the board is unholy in God's sight. Regardless of how small it may be to us, it is still unholy to the holy, holy, holy one, to the perfect one. Sin across the board is unholy in his sight. And he has ordained to redeem his people to himself in spite of their sin, regardless of what it is. Regardless of what they've done in their life, their sin cannot overpower his grace to effectually save. That includes all acts of sin. Romans 5 verse 20, we read that where sin increases, grace abounds all the more. Regardless of, of the, uh, the external acts of sin and how heinous we may think they are in our life, where our sin uh, increases, his grace abounds all the more. His grace is effective to save any of those that he decides to save. There is no sin that will separate our God in Christ Jesus from his people whom he has set his heart in love to put his faithfulness upon and to save. His grace is sufficient to the uttermost. And church, it's really the arrogance and the pride of rejecting his truth that would even bring you to even think such a thing to begin with. It's the arrogance of thinking and living however you want to because God has revealed that truth clearly in his word. He has revealed that he saves his people despite their sin. That's what he has revealed in his word. He's revealed it regardless of what it is. So to think that you might be so sinful that God could not or would not save you in Christ is to pridefully and arrogantly elevate your own reasoning above what God has revealed to be true. It's, it's to say, uh, no, his, his thoughts are not actually higher than the clouds, than the earth and mine, the heavens and the earth and mine. I can actually think of something uh, that he hasn't revealed. No, this is what he has revealed, and we are to submit ourselves to it. Now, I understand an unbeliever may in ignorance think that that is humble thinking. Oh, I'm so sinful that he, he could never save me or wouldn't want to. But that's not humility. That's not humility at all. That's just another reflection of sinful pride in thinking the way you want to think and not how God has created and commanded you to think from his word. We are to humbly submit ourselves under his word, not privately think things or add to his word outside of it. And it's just another excuse that humanity can bring up to justify their remaining in sin. Oh, he wouldn't save me anyway, so I might as well just continue on in it. I might as well just continue on in sin. No, you just want the liberty or the freedom to do whatever you want to do and reject your creator, and that's just an excuse that you came up with to do so. Ultimately, in its excuse, it's an excuse that has come from their father, the devil, the father of lies. And we've already brought this out before in our previous lessons, but this is what all natural members of humanity do in different ways. They all do what they want to do in accordance with their own opinions and the passions of their fallen body and mind. And Diabolus, their father, the evil one who sways the whole world, he leads them in this. And seeing another aspect of this, uh, Bunyan adds in the narrative, he tells us that just in case that that knot should break, that just in case Mansell you know, wouldn't come to the place where they would never believe that Shaddai and Emmanuel would save them, uh, Diabolus hatched another plan. And in this plan, he would attempt to convince the town that Shaddai was raising an army to march against the town and utterly destroy it. Diabolus' hope was to spread this news first in order to make any other news that followed unbelievable, that they would so accept that, Sh that Shaddai just wants to destroy them that even if mercy and grace, uh, news of that came, they wouldn't even receive it. They wouldn't accept it. So if the town should hear of their deliverance, they would already be convinced that he was coming to destroy them. And so Diabolus then called the whole town and delivered a, de a deceiving speech to that end which I'll say right along with what we have just covered, it, it is an arrogant point of view. It's a prideful point of view that raises one's own opinions over the truth, a real truth that has come to us from our Creator. Because our God is not just seeking to destroy all of man's soul, but He's seeking to save His elect man's soul. He's seeking to redeem them. He's seeking to graciously deliver them to Himself, to give them eternal life, that they would be brought to Him to know Him, to know him in righteousness and peace and, and in true joy. And forgiveness of sins. He's seeking to save his elect man souls to the praise of his glorious grace in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and I know that because that's what he says in his word. I know that not because I'm arrogantly and, and sinfully seeking to figure out truth on my own, but because by his grace I've been given true liberty, true freedom, which is not the liberty to do whatever my 
sinful heart wants me to do. It's, it's the liberty to live as I've been created, to live as an image bearer of God. It's being set free from sin. Joyfully submit my mind to what he says on how I should think about things in his world as his creation. Which is certainly the contrast of how the devil seeks to lead the world. Just as we see here from Diabolus in giving Mansoul the, you know, the quote-unquote liberty to do all of their heart's desires. And then lastly, the third thing that we see that Diabolus does in response to Shaddai's promise of grace is he gives them his full armor. He gives them the full armor of Diabolus and the full armor of Satan. Now, this is certainly in direct contrast to the full armor of God that is expressed by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6. I'll read verses 10 to 18. Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 18 we're commanded, he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, keep alert with all perseverance. So this is just, you know, broadly speaking, an exhortation from the apostle to proactively live in the truth, to proactively live in accordance with the salvation that we've been granted in Christ Jesus in accordance with his word. In armor language, Paul is bringing about that we need to be actively pursuing truth and godliness from God's word and within the salvation that he has granted to us in Christ alone. We need to be walking in that, keeping alert in that analyzing our, our circumstances in life and what we go through on a day-to-day -day basis through that and responding in how our king would have us. It's a strong call to live and think in the truth in all aspects of our life against the constant outward temptations and lies from demonic forces and this wicked world system to do the opposite. And so within Diabolus' speech to Mansoul, as fallen members of man's soul, seeking to live in lies and opinion, he delivers them the exact opposite of that. He delivers them his armor. And I'm just going to read this, this little section of this from my copy of the book. He says, He says, Let me teach you the techniques of war. Come to the castle armory and equip yourself with my armor. If you wear it, nothing he, King Shaddai, nothing he can do, will hurt you. My helmet is the hope of doing well in the end, no matter how you live. Those who have had this helmet said that they had peace even though they did all the wickedness of their hearts. No arrow or sword can pierce it. Certainly a false hope. My breastplate is made of iron. I had it forged in my own country and all my soldiers wear one. Plainly speaking, it's a hard heart. A heart as hard as iron and as much past feeling as stone. Use this, and you will not be convinced by mercy or frightened by judgments. This is the most necessary piece of armor if you hate Shaddai and plan to fight under my banner. My sword is a tongue set on fire by hell that speaks evil against Shaddai, his son, his ways, and his people. Use this. It has been tried a thousand times over. Whoever uses it can never be conquered by my enemy. My shield is the shield of unbelief or the shield of calling into question the truth of the word, especially those parts of the word that have to do with the judgment of the wicked by Shaddai. Use this shield, Mansoul. Use it. Shaddai has made many attempts against it. It is true. But they, have written, but they that have written about Emmanuel's wars have testified that he could do no mighty work because of unbelief. To use this shield correctly is to not believe truth no matter who speaks it. No matter who speaks it. If he speaks of judgment or mercy, care not. If he promises that he will not hurt you, pay no attention. Question the truth of everything. This is the right way to handle this shield. Certainly we see much of that in, in our day and age today. Question the truth of everything. 
Is there even such thing as truth? Does it even exist? This is the right way, Satan says, Diabolus says, to handle this shield. And anyone who does otherwise does not love me. Because if you love the Father, you would love the Son. You would love truth. He further says, a prayerless spirit, one that refuses to cry for mercy, is another piece of my excellent armor. Be sure you use this. Cry for mercy never if you are mine. I am certain that you are strong and that I have fitted you with impenetrable armor. I also have mauls, firebrands, arrows, and death. All good weapons for destruction. So never cry to Shaddai for mercy. Remember, I am your rightful king, and you have taken an oath and entered into a covenant to be true to me and my cause. All the kindnesses I have shown you require loyalty. One more word and I am done. If we can just stand against this one violent attack, I do not doubt that in time the world will be ours. When that day comes, I will make all of you kings and princes, and what splendid days we will have then. Diabolus then doubled his guards at the gates and shut himself up in the castle. The people of the town practiced using their weapons and learning combat techniques. They sang songs about their tyrant, and they bragged about what they would do if there was a war between Shaddai and their great king, Diabolus. Certainly, they would do that. Fallen Mansoul would do that, because sadly, as we've said several times, that is the natural state of humanity. That's the natural state of those around us who have not been redeemed in Christ, who have not been brought out of falsehood into the truth. They don't seek for God, and within that they seek the devil who lures and entices them by their own desire all the way to destruction. What folly to think uh, that someone can actually conquer uh, our creator who upholds everything by the word of his power. They wouldn't be able to think that if he wouldn't uphold them to even think that. He could stop them in an instant. What folly. As, as Psalm 2 says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. Such ridiculousness. But beloved, that's where we would all end up if it were not for the grace of our God in Christ Jesus. If it were not for the grace of King Shaddai in his son Emmanuel. We would be those who would allow Diabolus to keep the truth from us, who desire the liberty to do all that we please, and who willingly wear his armor instead of that which our God and Creator would have for us. But praise God for his wisdom and love that he gives us in Christ and pulling us out of that, to live joyfully in the truth, reconciled to our God and also reconciled to his church where we can stand side by side for the sake of the gospel, not frightened by our opponents. Praise God for his wisdom and love. And if you're not in Christ this evening, if you're not in Christ, if you haven't entrusted yourself to Christ Jesus, may you by his grace heed the call to repent and believe the gospel. The scripture is very clear that today is the day of salvation. Now is the favorable time. Repent and believe the gospel. Because apart from this, you are living in the condition of what we've exactly covered this evening in the Holy Lord. You're living in that condition. Your will is seeking to keep truth out. You're seeking the liberty to do whatever you want to, and you're seeking to wear the armor of the devil. Repent and believe the gospel by God's grace and for his glory, and you will come out of that. Well, that concludes what we're looking at this evening. Uh, next week, we will be putting our focus on the next section in the story, which is the army of Shaddai and Emmanuel and their captains. We'll be exclusively looking at them gather their army and their captains and what their captains stand for in uh, in, in what the allegory means for us today from God's word. Uh, but apart from any comments or questions, we can go on to our review.